Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jan Matějek, also known as Matějčík. Uh, in most places, it's dot Matějčík on the Discord for PyCon, so feel free to reach out. And this talk is going to be about what I do at my day job uh, as the head of firmware at Trezor Company, which is um, writing performant code in Python and Rust on a very small CPU. <clears throat> uh, I like open source. I like embedded development and challenging problems with tight constraints. So this thing hits all three, uh, not the last one, sorry. Uh, a little about MicroPython. MicroPython is an implementation of Python 3 for microcontrollers, so very small CPUs that run on bare metal, no operating system, etc. The language itself is somewhere between Python 3.4, 3.10. Uh, it's important to say that MicroPython is not a dialect. It's actually a full-featured Python you get uh, all the features, the descriptive protocol, decorators, iterators, uh, you name it, basically. And this brings some troubles, as we will see later. Uh, MicroPython has a garbage collector. Uh, it's implementing the simple mark and sweep algorithm. It works perfectly fine as long as you have enough memory, which is not our case, unfortunately. Uh, it does its best to be memory and space efficient. And for a Python, it's also reasonably fast. Uh, it's pretty good if you want to run something on a microcontroller. A uh, little about Rust. Rust is the new fancy thing. Uh, it's a low-level systems language, but it offers very high abstractions. It's new, it's very modern, very user-friendly. For instance, the compiler warnings are just great. They tell you what's wrong, where it went wrong, and often even how to fix it right there. And the main advantage over MicroPython is that it's blazing fast. Uh, it's compiled language, so runs machine code natively, and it gives us something called zero-cost abstractions, uh, which means you can write code that looks very high level. You can use advanced features. You can do objects, new types, iterators, lambdas, generics. You can move things around in memory. And uh, the compiler takes care of optimizing all this away, and it costs you nothing at runtime, which is great. And another great thing is that it's safety-oriented. Um, there is this thing called a borrow checker, uh, which at compile time disallows you to make um, pretty much any sort of memory error. Uh, and there's, of course, the coolness factor. Rust was winning developer surveys at Stack Overflow for several years now. So it's just nice. <clears throat> Something about Trezor T. Uh, it's a hardware cryptocurrency wallet. Looks like this. No, I will not be passing it around. Um, <clears throat> and of course, the security of this thing is critical. We really don't want to make buffer overflows in firmware for this, because then someone could steal your bitcoins. Uh, nice thing about it and about our whole company is that it's completely open source, including the hardware schematics. So you can go to the store, buy an STM32, buy a display, solder it all together, load our firmware, and you got yourself a Trezor. <clears throat> the CPU inside is an STM32, uh, which has two megabytes of flash, that's like hard drive, and 192 kilobytes of RAM. Not a lot for a huge Python project, uh, which this is. Uh, for a Python project, especially for a micro Python project, this is pretty large. We have something like 70,000 lines of code. <clears throat> And we actually need this to go faster, because we are hitting performance limits and memory limits of the CPU. Uh, we first chose to write the firmware in MicroPython because it is safe. Uh, you can write code that is high level, and you do not need to worry about errors in memory. Uh, and for this reason, we didn't want to optimize just going to C, because C is very dangerous. And so when Rust came along, we said, yes, that's the great thing. We're going to do that. <clears throat> uh, just quickly about this talk, uh, I will be talking about implementation details of MicroPython, which is written in C, uh, about API for extending MicroPython, which is also in C, 
uh, rust interoperability pitfalls, so like problems we encounter on the boundaries with C. So like maybe I should have gone to a C conference, but you guys were interested, so <clears throat> let's get to it. First, something about MicroPython internals. In Python, everything is an object. We all know this. Uh, in C, there are no objects. So we need to represent the Python object somehow. And uh, everything that comes from MicroPython, everything Pythonic, is actually a pointer. A uh, pointer is just a number that uh, tells you an address in the memory. And this mp underscore object underscore t is a type that we'll be using everywhere. Uh, every object is allocated in a garbage collector arena, which is a chunk of memory which you pre-configure before starting the MicroPython interpreter. And the allocation runs in 32-byte chunks. <clears throat> so every allocation reserves one or more chunks and returns you a pointer to the chunk. This means that the granularity is 32 bytes, and that means that every valid allocated pointer has all zero lower bits. Which is cool, because that means that if something does not have all zero lower bits, then it's not a pointer. And we can use it for something else. Uh, you can see this is a pointer, this is a number, but if I set the lower bit to one, it's not a pointer anymore. I can represent a constant. It could be none, it could be true, it could be false. I can set some bits and represent a small number that way, so I don't need to allocate every number. And I can represent Q strings. Uh, MicroPython has two types of strings. One of them is the normal kind that you expect, and the other, end, the other one is so-called Q strings. It's interned, and it's actually a number with a special tag. And if you want to see what the string says, then MicroPython under the hood does a lookup on the number into a static table of all possible strings. So you can pass around huge strings, and they are represented by just the single number, not even an allocation which is great. Uh, the actual objects, not everything is a primitive type. Uh, the actual objects are allocated, so we need to check if the pointer points inside the GC arena, if all the lower bits are zero, and in that case, it is actually an object. And we need to look uh, what type of object is it. Uh, this is how the object looks in C. This is a representation of the list type, Python list type. The first thing is called base. It's a pointer to some type information, which is standard format. Then we have uh, size of the allocated list, the length of the items that are currently there, and then a new pointer, which is again of the type MP object T to the actual items of the list. So as it turns out, as we've seen, most things are not primitive types, most things are objects, and most things need to be allocated. For instance, every Python module that you import, it allocates the module in RAM, uh, because uh, modules aren't static. You're allowed to say, like, my module dot foo, uh, set that to something. You can modify the contents, you can delete attributes, add attributes, so we need this to be in RAM. Uh, every function that's in the module is also in RAM because uh, every function has a reference to its globals. You can pass a reference to a function to somewhere else, and the function needs to remember, remember which module it comes from. And the module lives in RAM, so the function also lives in RAM. Uh, you see where this is going. Uh, we have 150 modules. Let's say there's 10 functions in each one. Uh, it costs us 62 kilobytes just to import everything and we have 165 in total for the GC Arena. So we just lost one third of the memory just for loading the whole project. That's not great. <clears throat> this is, uh, I will try to switch to the memory map and see if I succeed. Here we go, yeah. This is a memory map of the GC Arena. Every single character in this map represents one 32-byte block of the garbage collector. And the first letter tells you what kind of, it, what kind of block it is. This represents uh, map storage. The Bs are functions. As are arrays, I think. I don't remember. 
And the equal signs are like this module is this big, this module is this big, etc. And dots are free space. <clears throat> Uh, we can see right now that the memory, I took a snapshot while Trezor is running, and we can see that the memory is pretty fragmented. There are some free spaces in the middle, and then there are big allocations. Uh, so some limitations. The speed of the garbage collector is actually problematic. Uh, the algorithm used here is mark and sweep, so it goes like this. First, you start with a pointer that you know. This would be your module globals or some other things. And you follow that pointer. It points to some memory. You walk that memory and look for pointers. And remember, like if you find a number, it points into the GC arena. All lower bits are 0. Then it's a pointer. So you follow it and read all the memory. And every pointer you find this way, you mark it as live and follow all the pointers from it. And when you cannot find any more pointers, you are done with a mark phase. And then you do the sweep phase, which you start at the very beginning of the memory map and see this is life, we will keep it. This is not life, we will deallocate it, make some free space. Uh, the problem with this is that the more objects you have, the longer the mark phase takes. And another problem is that allocating new things uh, is, again, a linear search from the start of the arena. So the fuller the memory is, the longer it takes. Uh, and of course, uh, in Python, you cannot control where allocations happen. Uh, you cannot explicitly deallocate. So like, if you create 1,000 objects in rapid succession, you get 1,000 new entries, even if those objects are immediately forgotten. And if something allocates an object that lives for a longer time, then that remains just in the middle of the arena. The next GC sweep will clear out the temporary objects that were there before, but you get right in the middle, you have some noise that you don't want there. <clears throat> and as you are running low on RAM, you need to call the garbage collector more and more often because you're running out of memory, but the memory is full, so it takes a long time. Then when you want to allocate something, that takes longer time again and again. So we actually need to gain some speed here. And to be perfectly clear, in Python, every single little thing is an allocation. So let's see some examples. Uh, not counting what happens in the constructor, how many allocations do you think this ca causes? What do you, two? Yeah. One allocation for the object, one allocation for the storage of its attributes. It's kind of a dict. How about this one? Two allocations again, one for the list object, second for the storage. How about this one? It's three allocations. One is for the first substring, second is for the uh, second substring, and the third one is for putting them together. How about this? Well, there's one allocation for creating the enumeration object, and every single loop allocates a tuple. So creating a tuple is another allocation. Uh, not counting what generator does, instantiating a generator is an allocation. And the best one I saved for last, uh, when you create a new number and the number is bigger than some threshold, then creating that number is also an allocation. So allocations everywhere. It sucks, really. <clears throat> Let's make it faster. Uh, besides being a low-level language, uh, Rust has one huge advantage, that it does not cause any allocation at all whatsoever, unless we explicitly request it. So let's start writing things in Rust. Uh, let's keep the high-level logic in Python. We don't need to rewrite everything. Uh, individual functions are going to be implemented in Rust. And then we can call into Rust for speed and profit. When you want to call C from MicroPython, you create a module, then you import it. Creating a module looks like this. Uh, it's an array of arrays. The first item is the name of the entry. The second item is uh, the value. So name, value, name, value, etc. Uh, 
This is how you declare a function. There's a, some magic that causes it to uh, be a MicroPython object. And then you just import the things in Python, and you use them as you're used to from Python. In Rust, it's basically the same thing. We have some nice syntax for creating modules. Uh, we have some object module macro, a name, value, name, value, and this also magically creates an object from the function. And the function itself looks like this. We get an argument which is of type object and return another object. Uh, the object um, is the universal type of everything. I've shown you this pointer before. And in Rust, we call it obj, object. The nice thing that Rust lets us do is declare methods on it and conversion functions. Uh, anytime I need to get a value outside of MicroPython, I have a conversion. Uh, I can try to get a Boolean from an object by calling some sort of function from MicroPython, and I can construct a new object from a Rust Boolean value by selecting the right constant. For other types, it's more complicated. Uh, most things are still actually objects, so we need some wrapper types. Uh, for instance, Python list does not have a Rust equivalent. It's an object with some methods, so we needed to implement some primitive type. Uh, under the hood, it's some object has methods, so I have a list type that also has methods, and that calls the MicroPython methods. Uh, we have wrappers for iterators, which is anything that Python can iterate maps, which underlie dictionaries and objects, string buffers, etc. And this is how, uh, how a Rust function that is callable from, Rust, uh, from Python looks. Uh, we get the number of arguments, we get the values of arguments, and then we can extract the individual arguments by asking whether there's a keyword argument called title, and we want it to be a string, these little question marks at the end mean if that failed, then fail the whole function. And when we extracted all these arguments, then we can run some Rust code. Now, let's talk about memory safety. Uh, the problem is that MicroPython is using a garbage collector. Rust does not like that. Uh, Rust has a strong memory ownership. Uh, if you own a thing, then no one else should be able to touch it, and the garbage collector does not want to guarantee this. Uh, we have some wrapper for it, but it's very unsafe because like, uh, we rely on the programmer to do the right thing. There is no guarantee that the pointer is unique, uh, and we need to do something about interior pointers. Uh, we also actually cannot allocate. I said that Rust does no allocations, and that's because it does not have a global allocator. Uh, anytime we need some memory, we need to ask the MicroPython garbage collector to give it to us. <clears throat> what about strings? Python strings are immutable, so I can just take them into Python, uh, into Rust, and still have some guarantees that they are unique, they are immutable and it's safe to convert them to the ampersand string, which is Rust's native string type. But what if we want a substring? If I move the pointer by one bit, one byte, then the lower five bytes, the lower five bits are no longer zero, so the garbage collector will collect it from me. That's a problem. Uh, so we need to create a special wrapper type that always keeps the head pointer and the length of the string and then we can ask Rust to give us a reference to the string in the native type. Uh, there are some safety concerns. I'm not going to go over those. And then we construct the string. And the nice thing is that this reference cannot outlive the parent. Uh, Rust does not let me store this pointer somewhere and forget about it. That's disallowed at compile time. <clears throat> and if I actually want to do hello from hello, I just put one into this offset, and that means the head pointer stays the same, but the string is starts later. Uh, last thing, exceptions. Python is great. You can race literally anywhere. I'm in the middle of a function. I don't like it anymore. Here you go. There's a value error. Uh, Rust also doesn't like this. <clears throat> Uh, 
you can only return an error if you announce it beforehand. <clears throat> you need to declare that the function returns a result, which can be either OK or an error. So what we need to do <clears throat> is catch the exceptions somehow and turn them into uh, return values. Another problem is that in MicroPython, the exceptions are NLR, which means non-local return, and it's a very fancy way of saying go to some other place of the program. And this is very problematic in Rust. Uh, in fact, uh, the NLR code actually miscompiles, causes something wrong because the Rust compiler cannot handle this. And even if it worked, uh, it breaks safety assumptions. Rust assumes that all the code that it generates actually runs, and if you skip over some parts, then you lose some guarantees and everything blows up in your face. And not at the moment either, it blows up in your face two hours later when you go through some memory or whatever. So we solve it by having this nice function catch exception that is actually partly implemented in Rust and partly in C. Uh, this part is a C trampoline that sets up the NLR mechanism the way that the MicroPython API tells it to do. Then it calls a Rust closure with its arguments. I'm not, not showing you the Rust part here because it's like three more screens. And then it means that in pure Rust, I can call catch exception, pass it a lambda, and this code inside executes. And if then exception was thrown, then the return value is uh, the value of the exception. And otherwise, it's the OK result. Finally, some results. Uh, when we started, we first decided to rewrite the protobuf codec. Uh, Trezor is communicating, communicating with PC through protobuf messages, and we got a five times speed up, and that's still including the Rust code creating the Python objects from the results. Uh, we now have a very nice UI toolkit written completely in Rust uh, with minimum memory consumption, um, there's actually still a huge Python file that for every layout function written in Rust, there's a corresponding function in Python that does things like if you supply this argument, then interpolate this string, and basically pre-choose the data uh, for, uh, for the Rust runtime. But still, we saved a lot of RAM, and we are going to get rid of this thing very soon, so that we am even more saving. And of course, because of the coolness factors, all our programmers are happy programmers because we love Rust and it's great. Thanks for listening. Uh, if you have any questions, ask them or ask me later or contact me on Discord or whatever. Thank you. And our first question is about numbers. How much memory uh, does the Trezor firmware take, and how much mem memory does the board have? Uh, the last part again, please. Uh, how much memory does the board have? Um, the, the MCU itself, the STM, has actually 256 kilobytes of RAM. Uh, we only can use 192 because of some technical limitation. Uh, there's a segment of the memory that was previously inaccessible to us. So uh, we have only 192. And uh, the Trezor firmware uses basically all of it. Uh, when it's idle, uh, I think the footprint is around 80 or 90 kilobytes. And when it's doing something, it really can fill up the whole memory. Thank you. Uh, how compatible is MicroPython with CPython? Do you develop and test with CPython? I I'm sorry, I don't understand you. <laughs> <from Sorry. here. laughs> Please repeat it. Uh, how compatible is MicroPython with CPython? Oh, uh, not compatible at all. Uh, there was some guy yesterday talking about HPy, uh, which is a way to write extension for any Python. So. I am assuming that HPy has a backend for MicroPython and completely separate for MicroPython. But the internal, internal implementation is like similar, but completely independent, completely incompatible. Uh, are you planning to switch to Rust completely? Uh, in the long term, ideally, yes. Uh, the first thing we are planning to do in the medium term is to reverse the control. 
right now we call from MicroPython into Rust, and we want to write the thing in Rust and be able to call to MicroPython for code that already exists. And then when this works fine, then maybe we can get rid of the remaining Python code and rewrite everything into Rust. Thank you. And a related good question. Uh, if you would need to write firmware from scratch, what technology would you start with? Uh, right now, because uh, when we started originally, Rust for embedded systems was basically non-existent. Right now, it's not completely mature, but it's fast reaching maturity. So I think if we were starting today, we would start with Rust and probably not even involve C. There's still a lot of C code. We have a cryptographic library that is very, very well proven, very well fuzzed, and it's completely written in C. If we did it today, we would probably do it in Rust also. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, can you see other potential uses of uh, embedded Rust uh, with Python? Uh, what are your future plans? Uh, let's see. Uh, well, uh, I get the feeling that most people do not do big projects in MicroPython. It seems like more of a hobbyist tool, like if your scripts are five modules and some code that runs in a loop and runs some sensor, then you do not need to care about performance because there's quite enough for it even on a microcontroller. So I think the main role of Rust in integration with MicroPython is when you want to do something big, and you want to keep the niceties of Python, because still Python is a great language, but you still need, you need to move the performance critical parts into something more low level. Um, I don't have any personal projects that would involve both MicroPython and Rust. Uh, one more about compatibility. What about compatibility of pure Python code uh, with CPython? Um, the compatibility of pure Python is like 95, 98%. But there are some tiny differences in some low-level details, like uh, when you slice with all three parameters, then it works a little differently in MicroPython than it does in Python. There's a list of like compatibility gotchas on the MicroPython page, but like for the most part, for 98%, it's perfectly copy-pastable. Thank you. Uh, if anybody in the audience has a question, just raise your hand. Uh, do you have any plans to evaluate Zig as an alternative to Rust? Uh, I've seen Zig. I still want to try it. I don't know how it works yet. Sorry. 